just making sure that I have everything that I need around me as we get started. I've got some books that I'll be showing you all here in a little bit. Okay, cool. And my scissors and some projects to show you how I mend. I've got a few pairs of jeans, um, one pair that has a crotch problem and one that just has like a hole in it. So I'll be showing you two different ways of sewing those up. And I have a few other little things that need to be mended by hand. So ooh, I can see, make sure that I'm in the frame. Okay. Um, and then I even have my, my little basket that I bring, um, like if I'm going to go sit on the couch and watch a movie, this little basket is some of my hand stitching stuff. So today I'm going to be work working and walking you all through predominantly hand stitching techniques. I have all the things that are like sewing on a button and uh, mending a tear. So I have a big huge tear right here that I've cut off some stuff. So hand sewing stuff is the stuff that we're going to be focusing on. Okay, I'm excited and nervous. But first off, I'm going to walk you all through Oh wait, before I get started on that, I'm going to bring up my Twitch chat. Okay, here we go. I can see the chat now. Hi, everybody. Ooh, so many holes in t-shirts, yes. So in my, my nifty basket, I've got a few t-shirts I have like a striped t-shirt collection actually and they all happen to have holes in them and I've started um, collecting a lot of other t-shirts that are like equally worn in to like patch them up so that they'll be like patched up with striped fabrics. Hello! <laughs> so many little boxes on my screen. Okay. Well, let's play through my PowerPoint presentation here. So let's just switch over to that screen sharing. And I'm going to show you some of my favorite inspirations of mending. So personally, I really gravitate towards um, the Japanese mending methods because I'm Japanese and I've seen Maybe that's why I gravitate towards it, but I really just like seeing hand stitches. So I also really love seeing like hand stitch quilts and stuff like that from all over the place. Um, and so a lot of my mending inspiration comes from 18th and 19th century mending artifacts. What we're looking at right now are multiple artifacts of um, indigo dyed cotton fabric that's all been pieced together by hand and then a running stitch is run over all of the textile on the right side to make it like extra durable. Here are two like threadbare jackets and the technique and the the style is called boro, um, and boro, the verb boro boro, or the adjective boro boro means threadbare. Um, and so the technique and the style has now a noun, boro, um, and that's like a style from the 18th and 19th century. And that has evolved in many, many ways to our now trending visible mending, which I also love. Sashko is also a Japanese technique. Um, 
You might have heard it pronounced sashiko, which is the American style of emphasizing that center syllable. The Japanese pronunciation is sashiko, where it emphasizes the ko at the end of the word. You can say it either way. I'll, I know what people are talking about and people say it different ways. It doesn't really matter. The um, definition is little stabs or little pokes. Um, and this is this Japanese style embroidery that is very identifiable with the contrasting stitches, the geometric shapes, and the all over pattern. Um, you can see in the right top corner that there is like a grid that's drawn out and then the stitches are guided over the, the grid. And the grid makes it very, very um, easy to make it like look as organized and like tidy as these examples do. Mine don't usually turn out this lovely, um, but it takes practice and a lot of patience to get our stitches looking as consistent as these examples do. Here's some more modern examples, um, images that I've pulled from on the right side, I believe this is Alabama Chianin, a um, Alabama-based hand stitcher a company that makes bespoke clothing, all hand stitching. And then we've got some like other stitching on the other side. And here are some interpretations of using those sashiko stitches, little pokes to mend your jeans and stitch through your jeans. Some you can do contrasting stitches, you can use thread that matches what we're mending as well. It really just depends on your personal aesthetic. I'm sure you all have seen these Boro inspired fashions all over fast fashion. It's, it's not as special as the archival stuff, obviously, because it's all been commercialized, but um, I think it has a certain charm to it. But personally, I think the joy is from mending things ourselves. Another type of mending is for knits, um, and that is darning. So if you're knit, um, if you have a knit item and the, it becomes threadbare, we kind of need to like fill in that space. Um, and so darning is like almost creating a whole nother layer of fabric by filling in the hole with stitches. Here's some more darning. I really like the top right um, photo that shows you how like a, a grid is formed with the threads creating a, a warp and a weft with the stitches and the bottom darning is for those knit stitches. So knits are a, ser a series of loops versus woven is a, on a grid. So that bottom right example shows someone stitching up the loops of the knit so that the the loops don't come undone. Like um, if you've ever gotten a run in a pair of stockings or something like that, um, that is where the loops all come unhooked from each other and then it like runs all the way down the item. So if you get a hole in like a sweater or a pair of socks, it's better to like mend it up really quick versus letting the hole get bigger and bigger. Oh yeah, this is some of the stuff that we're gonna be working on today. Mending those hard to mend areas. Oh, is that the end? Okay, great. That segue is, oh no, here's some more photos. Okay, so um, these are just photos from other workshops. I'm gonna go back one more. My computer is just a little overwhelmed. Let's see. Okay, yeah, so the the photo on the right here is another student photo, a uh, student project, and I love how they used a mix of some hand dyed fabric with some yellow stitches to really prevent this hole from getting any bigger. And I also like that they chose to leave the, the main hole a feature of the clothing, but really their purpose here was to prevent that hole from getting any bigger. Um, and I love to draw inspiration from all over. So I collect lots of like little cute photos like this photo of the sweater with the patches on it. It just really is inspirational in the sense of using fabrics that bring me joy and 
um, patching things so that like when I see them, I get a little, little happy feeling inside. Um, the fabrics around the, the little patches are Indian based fabrics and those are called kanthas. They are um, multi-layered cotton fabric that has running stitches all the way through and that's very similar to that Japanese all over running stitch and I just think those textures that are created with the hand stitched is just really really special. Oh and here's some um, inspirations that I collect on Pinterest. I, cl I have like a whole board just for mending jeans or just for upcycling jeans and pants um, on Pinterest and I just love collecting photos. There's been a big trend lately of using old quilts and I think if you find like a unfinished quilt or a threadbare quilt there are cool ways of interpreting that and mixing it into your mending journey. And I like how detailed these are. This t-shirt photo really inspired me to think outside the box with t-shirts and think very intentionally of like you can mend something to make it really blend in or like this photo of the red patch, it can um, be like an accent. And that is the end of my uh, slideshow officially. This is a piece that I have been working on for a while um, and I started it many years ago. So I feel like I'll start little projects and put them to aside and pull them back out at different times. And this project is a series of hand dyed fabric that I then stitched on top of and these little yellow stitches are called seed stitches. Seed as in like little um, plant seeds and they're just random stitches all over and I just like the unplanned aesthetic of them a lot. So thank you for watching my slideshow. <laughs> See if I can exit the slideshow. It is over. Can we quit? Yes. Yes, patched, patched inspiration, quilt, quilt coat inspiration is um, very trending right now in the, the fashion scene. So you can find lots of inspiration on Pinterest. Um, but don't waste too much time on there because the joy of Pinterest is that it's it's great to get those ideas running and it's better just to go ahead and like put it into practice versus getting overstimulated, getting overstimulated on Pinterest. <laughs> All right, yeah. Holes in sweaters. Oh my, I have so many holes in sweaters. One of the things, I'm going to start with something relatively simple that just will get us kind of warmed up. So if you have anything to work on right in front of you, I encourage you to get some pieces out. I'll show you. Let's see if I can pull out this camera. Okay. I'm going to show you a few of my samples that I've practiced on. This is a little Sashiko sampler. And... Some books. Here we go. So this is a great Sashiko book. I really like this author. She has very um, in-depth examples and lots of history and information in her books um, about ideas and patterns of modern Sashiko and little stitch examples. So if you're looking to get a book, this is a really good one. This is the ultimate. I think she also has like a, a thinner version of this. And this is my sampler that I made. And it is kind of like it goes from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom. And I just did a one by one inch grid using chalk across this dark denim. And using the grid, I created these petal shapes that eventually became like a, a wheat shape 
that eventually became these kind of like wave shapes. So using the grid, I could then create a more natural looking curve. And so it's nice just to start with a small scrap if you'd like. Here's um, another sampler where I kind of started the grid out, but I didn't get further than two little lines. Uh, this is like a square of quilted fabric that I pieced together and then I did my siege stitching and some French knot um, stitches and I put some quilt batting in there just to give it like a cool texture. And here's another Sashiko sampler of like a very traditional um, Japanese emblem symbol. Yeah. So lots of options just to get your hands warmed up even if you don't have anything to mend right now you can still like work on a sampler and just stitch some stuff if you'd like. Another book that I really like is this from Natalie Shannon, the Alabama Shannon uh, brand that I was talking about earlier. This book is all about hand stitching and just has a ton of an information on different types of hand stitches you can do. So if you don't have access to a sewing machine, you can still just have fun and play with different types of stitches. And what I like a lot about this book is that it comes with these stencils so you can like mark consistent stitches. So if you really want your sampler to look a certain way, you can use these proportioned out grids and that's really handy for like a beginner. Thank you for putting the link there. Um, I don't know if you'll find a link to this book. This book is a gift to me and it's a little bit of a rare book, but it has some amazing archival documented um, coats, blankets, Boro items. And this book has brought me, I've like marked this because this has brought me so much inspiration. Just seeing the amount of like care and attention people had put into their items. And these were like farmers, you know, fishermen, firemen, just like workers, working class people were having these handmade by their family members, by themselves. Um, I love this book so much. And this book was actually written by the same, same woman, Susan. Briscoe. I want to say her last name is Susan Briscoe. I just picked up this book actually at Joann's. I used my coupon and this has a lot of um, history. It has, you know, it had, it had a good amount of history in it and talks a lot about projects, more traditional Japanese projects using the visible stitches and the um, upcycling and wabi-sabi is a word that you may hear me use quite a bit and that is directly translated into the imperfect the joy of the imperfect is wabi-sabi the perfection of imperfection and i live by that i am not trying to be perfect i would drive myself crazy when i when i try to be perfect i drive myself crazy this book is all in Japanese and I actually don't read Japanese, um, the language. I can speak it a little bit, but I can't read any of it, this. But this is a book that I picked up in Tokyo while I was there in 2018 and 19, 2019, I don't remember. And this has a lot of like modern inspiration and I wanted to just pull up here we go. Some like fun, fun projects of mending things. Yes, you can kind of see that. Here we go. And a lot of different types of textures can be achieved in hand stitching. So that is what I go for. I really um, embrace the idea of the hand stitching itself is going to be the feature, not how perfect the stitches are. And 
one of the pieces that I've been working on for a long time. This is as a textile person. It's nice just to have projects that you can put down and not have to like finish right away. So this jacket I have been working on for who knows how many years at this point, at least three or four years. And I literally forget about it. And then I'll like be going on a road trip or something and I'll be like, oh, I'll work on this coat. And I have technically finished this whole left panel up until about the side, but this was, um, there were, there was no, no holes in this jacket, but it was like, um, just covered in stains. I don't know, maybe whoever had owned it previously had worn it to do like, uh, cooking or, or something like that. So it had all these kind of oil stains. You kind of see, maybe not. Um, it was just kind of like yellow and stained. So I wanted to just cover up the entire front to get rid of the stains. And then it kind of ended up becoming a whole nother project in itself. I put a patch on the back. And so I just had fun kind of doing different kinds of stitches, like not committing to too much, not being like, oh, I have to finish this whole quilt with this one style. So I just ended up using different stitches for different sections and even using some of my quilt blocks um samplers like sometimes I'll make a quilt block and then I'll be like I can't see myself ever making a quilt so I end up having some laying around so it's it was fun to use those up and I even I think there was a, a big stain right here on the cuff of this so I tried stitching in like some words and if I can just hold it up close enough to the camera, you might be able to see it says make do and mend. But this is about the extent of my, in my embroidery skills. Um, I'm more of just like a stitcher. I like to just do the running stitches and whatnot. So it's fun to, to experiment though. And to be like that, you know, was enjoyable to put on there, but I'm not going to quit my day job and start, um, stitching words into things or anything. So this is always a fun project to do. Uh, you can see right here, this fabric has like some prints with fans all over it. And then I ended up adding red stitches at the bases of each one of these fans. Maybe a little accent. Oh yeah. You can see a little bit of the red on the stitches. So you can, almost use a mixture of the fabric print and your stitch accents to almost create a whole new pattern or accent there. Texture. Texture is the word I was looking for. Okay. Let's mend some stuff. All right. So little t-shirts. Let's do little t-shirt holes. So I've got three t-shirts here. Oh, okay. Let me look at my, my, um, my camera here. I think I also maybe need to move this over. Yes. Cool. Did someone, oh, where do you get your fabric from? Um, I collect my fabric from all over. I'll, get fabric from, you know, flea markets and thrift stores. But I'll also like, if I want a really specific kind of fabric, I'll like look it up online and, and try and find fabric. Um, in Raleigh, there is a store, Craft Habit Raleigh, and they're a locally owned fabric store. And they've got lovely linens and cottons. In, in Durham, our locally owned craft store is Freeman's Creative. And I'll just type those two in. Craft habit, habit in Raleigh and Freeman's Creative in Durham. But also, a lot of my fabrics have been um, like clothing that I've taken apart or um, even sometimes in the past I've I've bought clothing from the thrift store just with the intent of using the fabric as 
like patch fabric and I will show you all what I mean by that right now. So I don't think I actually bought any of these items brand new. But this is my thin knit scraps bin. And I've put a bunch of like old tank tops and old t-shirts that were really, really thin. And I got thinking like, oh, maybe I'll wear this and then just never wore it. But then it was like so threadbare that I didn't want to give it back to the thrift store. Um, this was like a t-shirt that I got from a clothing swap, but it was like a crop t-shirt and it already had a hole in it. So I wasn't ever going to wear it, but I really liked the, the size of the black and white stripes. And then I also just like the weight of it. So it's like I got it from the clothing swap purely to use the fabric as it's, as it's uh, raw life. <laughs> and now I just can cut little squares. There's too many stripes here. I can cut like squares of, of scrap fabric out of this one piece and use it to patch my other items, which you can actually see that I used this to patch this black striped tee. And I'm going to pull that camera up just so I can make sure. Okay, so if you can see this little area right here in the middle of the t-shirt where the stripes are bigger, these are actually little patches. They're little circle patches. And I did my hardest to match up the stripes. And that was just kind of like fun pattern matching, you know, it's like a little game. Um, but also I used the circles because that would make it a little bit easier for me to have like a nice clean finish as I'm hand stitching it. Um, and if we look on the back side, might not be super easy to see, but these were really relatively small holes um, that I really didn't want to risk getting bigger. So I put a pretty big patch around the area. So if it was going to start unraveling, it would be protected all the way around. Um, another one of my patches on this t-shirt is right in the middle of the back. There was just like this tiny little hole, like almost there's actually a seam right here that goes down the back. I don't know if you can distinguish from the stripe, but it's like um, along the seam, the, the fabric had been cut. Um, so I just took another little bit of striped fabric. This was from an old tank top. And what I like is that the fabric is really, really soft. So, and then I also had this little patch on the sleeve. And so I patched that up. So it was, a little bit of a of a, a waiting game where I like was wearing these t-shirts with the holes in them for a really really long time until I was like I'm gonna match them up with this other fabric that I have so it's become a quarantine project to try and fix a lot of things so I finished this one t-shirt <laughs> um, now I have these two other t-shirts and I've used a safety pin to go ahead and you can mark your holes with the safety pin. So again, this other t-shirt that I had, it has a hole in it and I went ahead and marked it with a safety pin. And that way I know that that's a problem area. Like if I decide to cut fabric and use that to patch something else, I'll know that like this part of the fabric is no good that it has a safety pin in it. So that's like a little note to my future self, not to forget. Um, and once I cut out the patch, uh, the fabric to patch that area, I can just use that safety pin to hold it in place. And I feel like that's easier than using like a regular straight pin, which might fall out and you might lose your patch. So safety pinning some patches in place over where there are really small little holes. That's the first step is just matching up your fabric and getting your patches going. Um, this t-shirt was, um, it used to be longer, but there were so many holes 
in the bottom here and I almost matching them but I decided that just cutting them off and making it a shorter t-shirt was a better solution. I will say though that the armpit holes are were out of control. They're very very big armpit holes in this piece. It's like just falling apart. Um, and boro boro thread there in the armpits. So I used the fabric that I cut off the bottom to now patch the armpit. And I tried really hard to match up those stripes. And that's kind of just staying consistent with the idea that I'm being really intentional with this project and I'm taking the time to even match up the stripes. And you don't have to do that. You don't have to be that detail oriented with it. Okay, so let's start. I'm going to start with this one just because it's a less daunting project. This one has like these big patches in the armpits and I don't know, that just doesn't seem very appealing for me to focus on right now. Um, so I'm going to set myself up for success and pick a project that I'm going to like actually enjoy doing in this very moment. And I'm not going to patch this entire t-shirt, but I am going to show you putting on one of these patches. So I'm going to focus on this big one that has the most contrast. And in my little basket here, I've already pulled aside a pair of tiny little snips and I've got some large eye needles and I like the large eye needles, hand, hand sewing needles, just because it makes threading the needle a little bit less of like a cat and mouse game where the needle is the cat and I am the mouse. Um, and I'm also using, I'm going to use this silk thread today just because it's really, really soft and this t-shirt is really, really soft. So I'm trying to match everything. I'm also using this silk thread just because I don't have any other reason to use it. And I bought it like five years ago and I've never used it because I always thought that it was too fancy. And that is another quarantine project is that I'm like, just use it, you know, like I have this available to me, just use it. So I'm just gonna thread my needle here. I have very shaky hands, so I actually rest my hands against each other, like so, while I'm threading the needle, and I poke it through a little bit so that then I can pull it through. And we're gonna double up our thread, so I'm gonna make the thread length about the length of my arm, fold it in half. I'm holding the two ends of the thread together. I'm going to cut and I want to try showing you how I like to tie knots. Before I do that I'm going to wind up my thread here because I am being very frugal about this silk thread. All right, let me sit down. Okay. All right, so I've got my thread. It, I folded it over and I have two layers of thread here. I'm matching up the ends of the thread and the way I like to tie a knot is lick the tip of my finger and I'm going to wrap the thread around my finger once and then I use my thumb to roll that fat that thread together and licking the tip of my finger makes it easier to roll off of and then I kind of scrape it all to the end and that way I get this big messy multi layer knot that like kind of bundles up on top of itself. And that way I get a thick enough needle that doesn't just pull right through. It looks a little bit like a mosquito. So 
So now, as I'm stitching on a patch, I'm gonna double check. Okay, as I'm sewing on this patch, or before I get started, I actually like to run my fingers over the thread. This helps work out any kinks. And also um, when the thread is manufactured, it's very overspun. So when it comes off the spool, it likes to like have a little party and get really tangled up and like drive me insane. So I like to run my fingers over it and that kind of helps relax the thread and work out some of that overspunness. And also, our hands, they, they sweat, they have oil on them, and so putting that oil on the thread is also going to help it work through the fabric a little bit easier. Okay, we're good. If you would like to like set an intention, clean stitches, consistent stitches. All right, I'm ready now. So I am going to start in between the two layers. So if I pull that patch back, I have a space in between the two layers. So I don't really want to put the knot on the inside of the t-shirt because that's going to rub and rub potentially against my skin. I might mean, not want that. So in between the two layers, I'm going to start just, I'm going to stitch right up through the patch. And now that knot is on the back of the patch and sitting on top of the base of the shirt. And I'm just going to stitch that knot in between the two layers. And you can do a variety of stitches. You could just do a running stitch around the edge. The nice thing about using t-shirt fabric like this, I'm already getting a tangle. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to get frustrated. Um, but that is just going to happen. You're, you're going to get a little tangled up on top of yourself, which is why I recommend only using the length of your arm. If you have more thread than the length of your arm, you're going to have more thread than this motion requires pulling the stitch through and it's going to get very tangled up. So stick to just the length of your arm. Um, we are going to do a stitch where I just poke into the base of the t-shirt, go down, and I'm going to use the needle to just poke back up through the patch. So I'm just catching the edge of the cat, just catching the edge of the patch. And I started saying earlier that the nice thing about using this t-shirt fabric is that the commercially manufactured t-shirt, it's so tightly knitted that it's not going to fray around the edge. Whereas like woven fabric, like denim or jean fabric, that's going to fray around the edge because it's woven on a grid but the commercially knitted fabric here is going to be nice and tightly knitted and it won't fray. So I don't have to worry about really finishing the edges. I'm just trying to attach the patch over the hole. Maybe it's because this thread is really, really thin, but it's like, it likes to pull at different consistencies. So I'm just having to slow down and look at what I'm doing. Sometimes it can be a struggle to hand stitch and watch TV. I've poked myself a lot doing that. <laughs> um, but it's also just a nice time to, to zone out and stitch, hand stitch. So I'm just gonna go around the edge and I'm kind of using my hand on the back to guide my stitches, but also to make sure that I don't over pull and over tighten. So I'm kind of relaxing the stitches in between. I'm just going to keep going. And if I could get into a rhythm, it won't take me too, too long because it's a pretty small patch. But I don't hand sew that much. I really don't. So it takes me a little while to get into the groove of things. Um, I wish I could show you how not perfect my stitches are. They are very wabi-sabi. 
the thread is like a neon green so I'm wondering if you can see yeah you can kind of see on that navy blue stripe my stitches are all over the place and that is I am I'm happy with that the idea is that I'm just I'm just doing it that is the goal perfection is not the goal I have a, a hard time getting over the hurdle of, of just being motivated to doing something so I think this is a moment to celebrate that I just I got over the hurdle of doing it and getting all the supplies out that's another reason why I have my my hand stitching basket is because I keep a, a set of, of supplies ready to go right there so I don't have to use that as an excuse to not do this. Okay, my thread is getting caught on my safety pin. Whew. Okay, so as I go, I'm going to rotate my item. Don't forget to breathe. Sometimes while I'm hand stitching, I just like hold my breath like a, like a person who's overthinking it. So don't do that. And we'll just go all the way around. I think you get Get, get a good someone says sewing is pain sometimes it is um but you know I'm I'm a strong person so sewing is I don't know I hate that term pain is gain I don't like that actually I'm gonna maybe just go halfway and that'll give you a sense of how fast but also reasonably timed it takes to do something as intentional as this. It's a, a luxury to have time to sit around and also, you know, quiet. Um, enough to focus on something like this. So if you can't seem to find time to mend things by hand, that is totally okay. If you do find yourself wanting to do something very like tangible and tactile and also like very useful, I would say mending is a great little, little hobby to, to take up. And like I said, I don't hand sew that much, so it does take time for my hands to get into it. So give yourself plenty of time and space to work into your projects. Today we're starting with this project because I want my hands to be warmed up when I get to the jean project because that is going to be something that I want it to look a certain way. So we're going to work up to that project. And right now, I'm just getting to the halfway point of this circle. Now, I just want to tie off. Let's say I am done with sewing this patch for today, and I'm not done with sewing the patch. I could totally just leave that needle, like, like poke it in there, just like kind of leave it hand half poked in there and place it gently on the top of my sewing basket. But let's say I want to go ahead and tie a knot. I'm just going to do a little stitch right next to where I ended. And I'm going to sew through the stitch a few times. And this is because this fabric is so thin that I just want to do a kind of a few stitches to really make sure that my, my knot is secure. And then I'm going to poke. I did a few like flat knots on the top. I'm going to poke it to the inside, in between, and do one more knot, just for good measure. The way I tie knots is a lot like an embroidery French knot. So, it's very hard to can I maybe put the, the black t-shirt behind it. I create a loop with my thread coming out of my fabric and attached to my needle and then I use the needle to close that loop. I wrap, wrap, wrap the thread around my needle and slide it to the edge of the fabric. 
my finger on it and that way I can hold that knot up against the edge of the fabric and I get a, a nice tiny little knot but wrapping the needle with the thread gives it multiple layers so I can get away with just making one knot I'm going to cut with at least like a quarter of an inch little tail don't want to cut too close to my knot okay that's good for now and this has enough thread to do a little bit more, but really once the thread gets too short on your needle, it makes your stitches much, much harder. So I would say always leave about three inches enough to tie a knot, but you don't have to sew like right up to the edge of your needle. That's gonna be really, really hard to tie a knot if you sew right up to your needle. So this little bit might not even be worth me saving, but it's threaded on the needle. I'm just gonna leave it like that for a second. Okay, oh, let's do some hand stretches. I really like doing some hand stitching um, as, a, as a little fact, um, you, do, using your hands for different activities can help fight against um, like muscle fatigue, like arthritis, and stuff like that. And um, arthritis is caused by using our hands in the same way all the time. So, or like carpal tunnel um, is caused by using our hands the same way all the time. So if I, you know, am fatiguing my hands with just this one movement, it's nice to do something else like stitching and that's definitely different from like working on a computer those that's using different muscles in my hands i can already feel different muscles being activated in my hands so it's nice just to to use my hands but in a different way than i do on on the day-to-day -day. um another little thing that i've got in here to hand stitch where i had some um these are my fleece lined tights that I wear like underneath my pants on really, really windy days. And there was a little hole on the inside of the leg. And so I didn't want there to be a big patch on the outside of my tights here. So I actually patched them from the inside and stitched around the hole and gave it a little bit of extra patch around it. And I haven't actually worn these, so I'm not quite sure if patching the tights on the inside was a good move or not, because that's going to like rub against my leg, but we'll find out. Um, another thing about like very um, stretchy stuff is that it's going to pill over time, especially if you're wearing like um, leggings and whatnot anything where it's like rubbing against it it's gonna pill so this is kind of like a low quality polyester knit fleece so i keep this thing it's just it's a, called a sweater shaver you can buy it just about anywhere walmart amazon um i know that the sewing store in carborough called mulberry silks carries little sweater shavers they come in lots of different sizes but it's like a little fan with a blade on it on the inside of this little thing and it cuts off all the pills. So it's almost like mowing the lawn, but that just took my really, really pilly tights that I've been wearing for like five years and made them like re smooth. So if you find that one of your items, it's just, it's just pilly. It's not like there's no hole holes in it, but make it being really pilly makes it not like very appealing to wear. Using a sweater shaver is really nice for removing those pills. You can hear when the pills go in. And then there's a little compartment right here. This one is so old that I've actually taped the compartment on, so I'm not going to open it right now. But all of your pills get sucked into the little compartment. And um, you can get rid of those. So that's handy. 
So these, this whole pair needs that, but I'm not going to do the whole thing right now. Um, oh, I have this little patch to sew onto this thing. Oh, also I use the, sh the pill shaver for hats. Um, I have a few like uh, pullover sweatshirts and sweatpants that get really pilly from being worn every single day. Um, so I'll use the pill remover to really the yes people who have sweater shavers you know how good this is oh you deep hilled your couch so little secret I have deep hilled my flannel sheets that when like the all the friction of, of sleeping on flannel sheets it makes like certain areas pilly use my shaver on that and it makes my flannel sheets so smooth Okay, so right along the edge can be hard to get the pills off, so I'll actually like flatten it out so that I can sweater shave over that fold. Okay, sweater shaving also very handy to just use like when you're very, very bored or something, you just need to zone out, that's when you want to sweater shave because I hate having to sweater shave when I'm trying to like leave the house. It always feels like it's such a chore and it takes forever. But if you take the time to be like, this item needs to be sweater shaved. Oh, I actually think I pulled an item. So this is my, my cashmere sweater and I bought it at a thrift store and it's, it's, you know, I'm trying to get it to lay flat. The cashmere itself is really high quality. It's lovely, super soft, um, but it gets super pilly. And I do wear this every other night, um, especially during the winter. So it's just going to make this garment shine like it's supposed to, like it's a cashmere sweater. changes the texture and the appeal of it and I definitely am you know texture person so I feel like the pills themselves can be like an uncomfortable texture especially like if it's on the inside of a cuff or something so peeling rolling your cuffs back and sweater shaving along where your skin is touching that's like you know that's real self-care right there sweater shaving is the real self-care but this this is like a whole project to do this whole robe style sweater um and i will lay it out on my couch and sweater shave it okay i'm not going to keep using the sweater shaver because it's way um too fun <laughs> I miss thrifting too. Good for you. You haven't gone in a year. I commend you. Yes, wearing the cozy sweater itself is also self-care. So I'm looking forward to, to, oh yeah, especially on the inside there up against my butt. That is getting, oh, I can't wait to do that. Okay, keep it together. <laughs> stay focused. Um, so I was going to sew this little patch on and I know I said I wasn't going to sweater shave, but I want to sweater shave the edges of this patch. I feel like polyester things get really, um, un unattractive, hard pills on them. So I want to sew this little patch on. I think
think this was an iron-on patch originally. So I ironed it on, but you can see that the iron-on glue has like worn off um, after years and years of wash wearing it and washing it that it's a, I think this is a, like a staghorn beetle or a rhino beetle. And it's a patch that I, you know, bought on a trip somewhere. So it has like sentimental value to it. So I definitely don't want to lose this patch. And I've got a whole variety of thread here. So I just decided to bring it all over just to show you. Um, but yeah, it's nice to have like options. I feel like this could be a good opportunity to use like a, a contrasting thread. So I'm gonna use this neon green. Ooh, no, I think I'm gonna use this neon pink. Neon pink. All right, when you're sewing, you gotta have some tea. Okay, so I'm using the hot pink. And again, I'm just gonna start with the length of my arm. And then I'm gonna fold that over. So let's get a new fresh needle I got these needles from Freeman's Creative. You can order on their website and pick up um, in Durham if you'd like. And this pack was $3 and there were, I think, nine needles in here. And I really like these big eye needles. And there's long ones and short ones. And for this project, I'm gonna use a short one because it's a relatively small space. When you're threading uh, your needle, you might find that it's a struggle and that might be because the thread is all bushy on the end. So using a really nice pair of, or a pair of really sharp scissors, they don't have to be nice scissors, they just need to be sharp enough to get a nice clean, crisp edge on your thread and that's gonna make it easier to thread through the eye of your needle. Even so, might not go per might go go that smoothly to begin with. Get a, enough through where I can pull it, and this is a small patch, so I'm I'm thinking I don't need a full length of my arm. I'm gonna do like the the length of just like to my elbow. Okay, and my body is all twisted around. I'm like ugh, not making it easy for myself, so. Breathe and make myself nice and comfortable as I settle in to do another little project here. Okay, so I've tied my knot. Okay, so again, I'm going to stitch in between the patch and the hat to get started. So I'm gonna stitch into the patch. And with these types of patches, these like embroidered on plastic felt patches, the embroidered area is gonna be really, really thick to sew through because it's been embroidered over. So I'm just stitching through the felt edge. That's going to be the easiest place for me to be able to stitch through and not wear out my hands. Well, I forgot to do my, my little finger running meditation. Consistent clean stitches. I'm not going for perfection, just keep this patch in place. Okay. And I think if I flip this so that I'm just looking at the patch itself. I am 
just gonna do little running stitches along the edge of the felt, along the edge of the embroidery. So I'm just gonna go in and out. Well, I don't know if I like the look of that. Okay, I'm gonna loop around the edge. I changed my mind. So I'm gonna poke up through the felt and then poke down through the hat. And this is gonna create like a vertical line going across the felt area. I'm gonna poke up through the patch. I'm gonna go ahead and check on the back to make sure I'm not getting some big crazy knot or loop. I'm gonna poke into the hat. Oops, you might have to poke around a few different times to get it to where you want it to come out. And poke into the hat. My first two stitches look really nice and straight. My third stitch, not so much. That's okay. I like to also hold the thread out of the way on the back side sometimes because if the thread is really, really long, it might get tangled up. You don't want that. So as I'm pulling this stitch, I'm like pulling it over to the side and just holding it in my hand so it doesn't get tangled up as I'm pulling the thread through. These stitches are very small, but I am making pretty quick progress. My hands are warmed up more than the last patch. Holding the thread to the side and poking down. I almost went around and poked through and that's that happens kind of a kind of a lot if I'm not paying attention. And that's totally fine. I just would like cut the thread and tie a knot and start fresh. Poke around a few times. I keep poking into the embroidery and I don't want this pink thread to cut into my beetle. So I'm just staying right on the frame. Yeah. Yep, the pink thread looks really cute up against the green and yellow and black of the patch. Can you see? Can you see? Like how close can I get? <laughs> Yay, there's tiny little pink stitches. <laughs> so yeah, picking contrasting thread. Also, I just like looking at the pink and while I'm doing this, it's bringing me joy <laughs> in a small, cute way. And also I don't have that many other projects that I've been using these neon colors on. So it's just fun to find a project to use that supply. Again, like I said about the silk thread, I've got it. I'm excited to use it. Okay, I'm going over my rhino horn here. And I'm putting my nail right next to where the stitch is coming out to kind of like give it some pressure. And in order to make sure that I don't stab my thumb as I'm doing this, I like poke around with my thumb nowhere near that area until I can get it kind of going. And then once I know where the needle is coming out, then I can use, I can move my thumb into position and use it for leverage. But uh, sewing, hand sewing is, is good practice on so, uh, spatial awareness because I'm somehow aware of where all of my fingers are so that I don't stab them. That doesn't mean that I don't stab myself. It just means that I'm more aware of like what my body is doing and how I'm sitting and interacting with this piece here. Oh, it's already seven o'clock. Gotta get to our jeans. All right, so I'm not gonna finish this patch right this very second because I'm not even halfway through. But again, another reason that I like having a whole pack of these needles is that I can just leave this in this project to finish later tonight. And I'm excited. I've had this um, patch for so long. Like I almost want to say like, like a decade. <laughs> so maybe not quite a decade, but I'm excited to 
to be putting that on there. Um, before we get into jeans, I'm going to show you a few more hand sewing techniques, including the invisible stitch of stitching up like a pillow, or if you're trying to bring two seams together um, to stitch them and you don't want it to show, I'm going to use these little miniature plushies that I'm making as a gift for one of my friend's babies. And I'm going to use some of my neon thread to show you and maybe that will give us enough contrast. Actually, I'm going to use black thread. I feel like that will be more. So if you don't have a thread rack, I would recommend just having like a little sewing, uh, like a Tupperware. This is just like a, a makeup organizer that I picked up at Target in the $1 section. And it's been very handy. I like having clear containers for stuff like this, but I've got a pair of little snips in here. Um, I also really like to use these little quilt clips. But if you don't have specific quilt clips like this, this is for, this is going to be for holding our opening closed without having to use pins. I would say, um, Yay, a Wayne's World patch. Throwback. I love that. Well, if the patch stays on your item, that was a success. And you can always revisit it and re-sew it on later on if it ever starts coming off. Okay, so when I'm doing pillows like this, it's hard to take a pin and poke it through. But when I do, I like poke the pin down into the the, the stuffing. Um, but still, like, it's just um, kind of annoying to have that pin sitting there. So instead of using a pin, which pinning is not the easiest thing, I will say. It's not always the easiest thing. Using these little quilt clips or even binder clips. If you don't have the quilt clips, you don't have to go out and buy them. You can use a binder clip. Bam. That's going to keep our closer shut. For the purpose of this exercise, I'm going to use the quilt clips just because they're more compact and it'll be easier for me to sew around them for right now. These are also like miniature quilt clips. Their little clip area is very, very tiny. And other quilt clips are, they're like larger versions of them, but I am just happen to have these tiny ones on hand. So what I'm doing right now is I'm taking the seam allowance, the edge of the fabric, and I'm tucking that to the inside of my little plushie here. Okay, so I have my closure all closed up. And I'm going to get some of this black thread. And I'm just going to go for the length of the arm. Okay. Nice clean cut, fresh needle. So if you don't mind your stitch to your stitches being visible for closing up a pillow or a, a doll like this, you can totally do a whip stitch around the edge. And that is going to make your stitches visible, which is fine. So if you don't mind, just go for the whip stitch.
But if you want to do an invisible stitch, I wonder if I can zoom in my camera. Give me one second. I am going to open up my camera settings and see if I can't zoom in to get some better quality than just holding it up. Nope, I don't know. Yes, my sewing um, studio is actually very well lit. Right now I have the overhead light on and I actually put a ring light. Um, like I got a, a really small, cheap ring light and I use that to light my sewing space. Okay, I couldn't figure out how to zoom in the camera, so we're just going to go for it. All right, so again, I want to start with the knot on the inside. I don't want the knot to be visible. So I'm going to go ahead and take that first clip off, and I'm going to stitch in between my two layers with making sure that the knot will end up on the inside of our pillow here. So whip stitch would just be bringing the needle around and sewing through and that kind of thing. But our invisible stitch, I'll clean up this area just a little bit. There are these extra threads coming from where I machine stitched it. So I think I'm just going to trim those. So in an invisible stitch or a ladder stitch, we are coming out of one side of our pillow and I'm going to stitch right along the fold or the edge of the seam allowance and stitch up. Then I'm going to go and jump right across. So if we are going up the side of the rung, now I'm going across the rung. And I'm trying to stitch into that fold and to hide my stitch. So I'm going straight up the side of our rung or up the side of the ladder. And I'm going to, if I over pull it, I want to like relax the threads again. But when I'm going to run my fingers over this, can't forget, invisible stitches, invisible stitches. Okay, now I am going to go across my rung stitching up the side of the ladder, poking out, pulling it through. And this is giving us nice hidden stitches. Not completely hidden, you can like still see them, but it's relatively hidden up the side. And I'm gonna remove my clips as they get in my way. Pull that stitch go across the rung. So going straight across parallel to the other side of the fabric to catch is the goal. Like going straight across is going to create a hidden stitch. I might have to kind of pull them tight as I go. Oh, don't forget to breathe. And again, I kind of have shaky hands, so sometimes it takes me a second to really get my needle into the place where I want it to be. I just have to have patience. It takes a, a fair amount of motor skills and hand-eye coordination to do this. So again, if you're, if you're struggling to begin with, that is totally okay. It's very worth it to stick with this as like a fun activity. It might not seem fun at first, but once you get into the hang of it, it gets more fun and fulfilling. I would say also just being able to mend your clothing and stitch up something really quick. Like if you have a, like this would be a great stitch if you had um, like a side seam or like a, a seam and a jacket came undone and you have a lining to it and so you can't stitch on the back side and you need to do an invisible stitch. 
that's like when you would use a stitch like this. Okay, this was a nice small opening, so I'm just going to go ahead and finish it and tie it off. I can see a little bit of my seam allowance is starting to poke up, so I'm going to use my thumbnail to really push it down into the pillow, manipulating the fabric to, to lay how I want it to. There we go. Like I said, this is going to be a gift for a little baby, and they are not going to care about how perfect and invisible my stitches are. So I am not worried about that too much. Meanwhile, I started this project before the baby was born, and now the baby is well over a year old. So my goal really is just to finish. <laughs> Okay, so now that I've finished, if I pull it really tight, it's going to pull all the stitches tight. So I just want to pull it tight and then kind of relax my stitches out again. And I'm going to do my loop with my left hand. And I'm going to take my needle in my right hand and I'm going to wrap the needle or wrap the thread around the needle like three times. And then I can pull the needle out. And now I have this... Now I have this knot boop, boop, that's really quite big and messy and there we go and if I use my hands I can scooch that needle or that knot all the way to the edge of the fabric. Great and then I'm going to pinch it and pull the thread through and that way my, my knot is right up against the edge of the fabric and I actually can then poke the needle back through the fabric, just poke it out of the pillow at any old place and pull that knot and I kind of can like yank that knot into the fabric. Maybe not, the knot is hidden though, or the tail is hidden now in the pillow. And I'm just gonna cut the thread. I don't wanna cut into the pillow, but then you can kind of hide your tail in the pillow there. Here we go. Right, one down. I've got four more to go. These are all some, some fish. All right, what else do we have in my mending? We got another pair of tights. We've got another t-shirt. Got this project. Oh, and a little snacky. Cute. All right. Whew. It is time for jeans. <clears throat> I'm excited to show you mending some jeans. So this is a pair of my partner's jeans. And so I'm not trying to do anything too elaborate for these jeans. I just am patching these up. Oh, and actually, there's an old patch that I patched on these already. So these jeans had indeed ripped along the back seam and then become threadbare. So they had become threadbare like this, where the threads had unwoven. So now there's like, if I cut this thread out, which I will... You can leave these threads if you want your patch to have a lot of texture, but I'm going to remove these so that we can better see. Trash. Can better see that there is like a hole where those threads used to be woven together as fabric. Let me bring it over here. So that's what had happened to this rip along the back. And so I patched these from the inside. I removed the threadbare threads and I patched these on the inside. And it looks like I even added an extra patch. Like, um, like maybe the first time I patched it, I didn't make the patch big enough or something. So I add another patch to the back there. Oh, and 
this is a pretty common place where Adam hooks his keys onto his belt loops. So you can see where there was a hole along there. So these were uh, patches that I stitched on the machine. So I used a zigzag stitch and some navy thread and I just put that patch in place, pinned it, and then zigzag stitched back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to just attach it. And that's going to keep it from fraying, is just really sewing it down. So. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to patch this area. And again, when it comes to patch fabric, I just have this bag full of tiny little jean scraps. Like if I trim, if I cut a pair of pants, like I want to crop the pants or something, I'll save the, the bit of the end there. And I don't really want to use this fabric. It just seems way too light. And this fabric kind of seems like it'll be better off. And I want to pick a patch that will cover up the area that isn't just ripped, but the area around it too. So if this area around this patch is also threadbare and getting ready to tear again, I might as well go ahead and patch it up now. Clean up my workstation here a little bit. And I'm going to use that thread. I'm switching between sitting and standing. So I have a like a foam mat that I like to stand on when I stand at my workstation. Let me move my water away because I might knock it over. I've got my needle and thread here. Okay. Pretty good setup. And I've got my, I've got a few tool marking tools. I've got just like a, a pencil that has a piece of chalk Few pieces of chalk sitting in it and then I also have this chalk powdered chalk dispenser um, so there's powdered chalk that you put into this top area and a little wheel down at the bottom and the wheel turns and dispenses the chalk and that's a really nice thin thing and then this pencil is has like a chunk of blue chalk sitting in it so for this purpose we'll probably use the white chalk so it's more visible and I'm going to put the patch on the back side and pin it in place I can't decide I think I'm gonna do this patch yeah so if you have a sewing machine I would go ahead and zigzag stitch around the edges of this patch but if you don't have a, a sewing machine, you can like fold this part under and stitch it. Or you can use a pair of pinking shears to cut the edges. And just to prevent more bulk from adding up to this, I'm gonna use the pinking shears instead of folding the edge over. A little bit more to the center of my screen here. Okay, so we're going to patch up these jeans right here like this. The first thing I'm going to do is just try and put this patch on the back side. 
instead of getting in there and trying to get it on, I'm going to put this patch into the hole itself. And I can also see that my the pocket fabric is sitting right here. So I want to place this patch in between. Like I don't want to sew the pocket. I don't want to get the pocket caught in between the patch and the fabric hole is what I was trying to say. So let me get this in place. And I'm kind of using my hands to distinguish that I've got it centered. I'll flatten it out. And now I'm going to get my pin cushion. Not all pins are created equally. I would say that these um, flat head pins with the little flat head, those are really thick and blunt. They aren't like the sharpest pins. So they're good for things like denim and whatnot, but they're not great for finer fabrics. Um, but we are going to pin this in place as best as possible. I'm trying not to move the patch around, so I'm actually going to come in with my hand all the way up the leg to really use it to pin in place. And I also don't want to get the pocket pinned, and I realize that this piece I just pinned to the pocket. So I want to make sure that I pin this separately so that we don't end up sewing the pocket to the patch because that'll make our pocket smaller. And I want this user experience to be just the same with the patch. I don't want it to be like, oh, now I have a patch, but my pocket got smaller. No. Focus really quick. Nope, that's very blurry. That is more focused. Okay, I'm just trying to get it a little bit clearer, but I think this is as clear as it goes. Okay, so I'm back to pinning. I don't want to put too many pins in because that's just more pins to get in my way later. I want to pin just like one on each side to start off with. And if you need more pins than that, go for it. But I'm also trying to keep my patch as flat as possible. I don't want to pin any like wrinkles or folds where I can't see it. Okay, that's enough pins. And I want to do some nice, consistent, straight stitches here. So I'm going to use a ruler. I love these clear quilting rulers, these plastic rulers. They usually have multiple guides on them. So I'm going to use this to, and this is going to be a labor of love, this patch. This was a utilitarian patch in the crotch. It does not look pretty, but this patch is going to be way more visible. So I would like for it to be a little bit nicer. This fabric is kind of light. So these white lines aren't really showing up. It's nice side light too. So I might have to run my chalk over it a few times. And I'm making lines about every quarter of an inch, and I'm just eyeballing it right now. I'm, I'm going for it. I'm not making my, my lines perfect. The fact that I'm using a ruler at all is, um, I'm like, I usually don't do that. I usually just dive right in when I'm sewing my own stuff. But since this is for someone else, I'm trying to make it a little bit more intentional, you know. I'm in the mood. Okay, some of my lines got further and further apart, so I'm trying to bring it back to a quarter of an inch here. And I kind of am just avoiding the pins as I do this. Okay, some of my marks earlier on did not really show up, so I'm going to go over them again. 
And I also don't want to rub off my lines. Like this is just chalk and it's literally just sitting on the surface. So part of the technique for sewing is not rubbing off all of our markings now. So I might have to reapply these lines later on and that's totally fine. Okay, so now I've got these little white lines. And using this navy thread, now I'm second guessing myself. This is like too turquoisey. And this is way too light. Mm, I might just go with. Let me pull the thread down. I'm going to go with this turquoise. It's going to be the most similar value color. So I think once we get it on there, it's going to blend in. All right, I'm getting another needle. Going for the length of my arm. Okay, let's see what the the chat says. Do I ever use iron on patches? I have used iron on patches on jeans in like really hard to reach places. Um, also when you just need like a quick fix, like if you don't have time to sew your patch on, you just need to go. An iron on patch is a great place to start. But iron on patches still need to be sewn on if you're planning on wearing and washing your item like on a regular basis. Um, if you're like, oh, I only wear these pants like once a week and wash them once a month or something like that, then you might not need to sew on your iron on patch. But um, if you have iron on patches, use them. If you don't, which I don't, I don't have iron on patches, so I just sew on scraps of fabric. And that works. Okay, I am starting, I've got my knot, and I'm gonna start in between the two layers again because I don't want that knot to rub up against the pant, the inside of the pants, so. And I also want to avoid this pocket, this pocket fabric right here. I really don't wanna sew this pocket fabric by accident. Also, speaking of sweater shavers, this this needs to be sweater shaved. This is gross. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, already I don't mind touching this as much. <laughs> Ooh, that's so much better. Okay, so I wanna make sure that this is out of the way. I'm actually going to use my binder clip and I'm just going to clip that pocket up out of the way. I don't want it to mess up how flat my pants are, so I'm going to just clip it. And that way I don't have to worry about it. I am going to move my whole thing up so that I can reach into the leg. And instead of having this whole long leg to deal with, I'm going to roll up the leg. So now I have this easy access to the inside of the pants if I really need to. I'm going to run my fingers over this thread. It's definitely overspun. I can feel it. Uh, someone said, I would sew the two sides of the whole pair of jeans together. So I have definitely done that but by mistake before. Um, I have also been like sitting on the couch and I've sewn the item to the clothing that I was wearing. So when I was like trying to pull it and look at it, it was literally attached to my clothing that I was wearing. So <laughs> sewing is funny. <laughs> All right, so I'm going in between the two layers and I'm using that chalk guideline and I'm poking out on that chalk guideline and I can feel my knot is now in between the patch and the jeans. 
So I'm going to do little stabs, my little sashiko stitches, little running stitches. And if your needle is long enough, which I chose a slightly longer needle, I can do multiple stitches. So I'm going to do like two stitches and then I'm going to pull the thread. Oh, and it got super tangled. So don't freak out. We're going to, okay, it's just like a huge knot. <laughs> Of course. Okay, it came undone. So if it gets really tangled, I would untangle it and then I keep my finger in that as I pull it down and that's going to keep it from tangling again. There we go. So again, just running my fingers over that thread. And I can actually take that pin out of my way now that I have a few stitches holding it in place. And I am going to keep doing a few running stitches. Having this hand on the inside of the leg really helps give me some leverage. All right, this turquoise thread is blending in pretty well. Okay, and now I'm jumping, uh, I'm like, I went down that first line and I'm going to just stitch on the back side of the fabric over to the next line, about a quarter of an inch away. I feel like there is a knot on the back side. No, there is not a knot on the back side. Great. Now I'm going to go up this time and I'm going to start stitching over that rip. So I'm just going to stitch right through it as if nothing is changing. I'm trying to catch a little bit of the edge of that fabric around the rip as I go. And then I'm getting back onto my chalk line. And my patch stops about right here. So I really don't need to go anywhere beyond like this. My patch goes from here to right here. So I'm just sewing the patch on. I want to jump over to the next line. So I'm going to stitch down to the back side and then stitch back up through on the line. Oh, that was close enough to the line, not right on the line. I'm going to do a few running stitches. I think with the length of this needle, two stitches. Okay, so the, the pin, the the thread got caught on the pin that was close by. So let's get back off the pin. There we go. Patience is key. And I, I do like to think um, of hand stitching as like my, my video game. And sometimes it requires doing it a few times to get the results that I want, but it's meant to be fun. It's, it's a, it's a test of my problem solving skills. Okay, thimble could be nice at this point because the fabrics are pretty thick. So I'm using my fingers to really push that needle through. Um, but these, these jeans are like really, really worn out right here. So it's definitely thin, like not as thick as it could be. Okay, this pin is in my way. I can take that out. And as I go, I can kind of like stretch my stitches out, make sure that I'm not getting too puckered up. Alrighty, so I would just do this all the way across the hole. And you could use the same technique for sewing up a hole like this. So we would pin that patch in place and just start stitching all over. Oh, this patch actually has a little hole in it. I want to make a mark of that. I'm gonna, I have a safety pin. Safety pin right here. I'm gonna make a note that this hole needs to be sewn up before it's worn again. So the safety pin is my reminder to not just forget that that needs to be sewn up. 
Okay, so I could keep going with that. I'm just going to keep going back and forth. But that's going to take me a little bit of, of time. So I'm going to give myself some, give myself a little break. Oh, stretch out. Oh, there we go. Put that aside for right now. And I'm going to pull out these jeans that are my own jeans. And they got super threadbare on the inside of the crotch where all the friction was happening. And so I already cut out all the threadbare area in anticipation of fixing these. So now I'm just left with this crotch hole. Yep, project switch time. So I'm kind of just opening up the jeans, get trying to getting trying to get it to lay the way I want it to. I don't want this to be like all the way like this. This is like would be very hard to patch. So I'm trying to get it to lay as flat as a three-dimensional item can lay. All right, and it looks like we only have about 15 more minutes left. So if you all have any questions, feel free to drop them in the stream chat and I will try and answer them before I sign off for the night. Um, but thank you all so much for having me and I am excited to show you our, our main feature here. Um, and if we have time, I'm going to try and leave a few minutes at the very end because I have one more item here and a little bug. Um, I have this one little hoodie item that has a tiny, tiny little hole that I think was actually came from our cat, our cat Claude. And so I wanted to show you how to stitch up a tiny little hole without having to use a patch. So I'm going to do these jeans and then just for the last few minutes of the stream, I will patch up that mini little hole. Or I mean stitch up that little hole. Okay, get my jeans to a place where I feel happy about them. And I have these, this scrap of jean, and amazingly, look at how amazing it, it's, it matches. Um, only these jeans that I'm working, working on are vintage Levi's, so they're no stretch, no stretch at all. They don't stretch. But the jeans that I found in my scrap bin, these are actually very stretchy. These have, um, these are obviously more modern and they have like a spandex or a lycra woven in with the cotton denim thread. So this is the most ideal scrap of fabric that I could have found right now. I'm glad that this was helpful. Um, and if you all are like on Instagram and you decide to patch some stuff, you should totally tag me. So I can see, because I love seeing what things people make. It's very inspiring to see other people's projects. Okay, I'm trying to get this to lay. And now I'm going to cut my patch. And I want this to stretch widthwise. Or maybe I want to switch stretch. Actually, I want this to stretch this way. Um, because it's not like my legs are going to get like longer or shorter, like going this way, but my butt is going to move a lot more this way. So I want the stretch of my patch fabric to stretch with the way that I anticipate the fabric stretching when I wear it. Okay, I could fiddle with this literally all day, but I'm just going to go for it. Okay, so I want to cut the patch at least like an inch beyond where it's going to lay. So just laying it on top and making a mark mentally. Boop, boop. Maybe I'll use like a, a piece of chalk. There we go. And then this goes to about right there. So now I'm going to freehand draw my line here. And I'm just going to use my pinking shears. I actually found these pinking shears at the scrap exchange and I they were very dull and I had them sharpened by a local knife sharpener. And you can get your scissors and your knife sharpened and getting these pinking shears sharpened was maybe like five dollars more than getting like a regular pair of scissors sharpened because they sharpen every single little groove. 
but if you can look at it, it's like a little zigzag. So when you cut it, I'm going to show you what happens when you cut with the pinking shears. The scrap exchange is great. I love it. It gives me the most affordable, um, like high quality thrifted items. Um, it's in Durham and Lakewood area and it is a like art supply thrift store. Okay, so the pinking shears create a zigzag edge, and that's just so that if it's if it's trying to fray, it like stops at the concave of the zigzag. Whereas this side is not pinked yet with the pinking shears, and so it's just a straight edge. So look at how much it's gonna just fray. This the woven threads just come undone here. So the pinking shears just give it enough like variation where the grid is disrupted. The grid of the threads for this woven fabric is disrupted and it's gonna stop the ravel for the most part. Okay, so I've got my patch here and I'm just, uh, I'm gonna do the same thing I did with the, the other jeans and I'm gonna tuck my patch in from the outside. I finally got the opening to lay a certain way. I really don't want to have to reach my arm in there. So I boop boop. Okay, you're in. Now I am going to reach in through the leg again. And I'm not trying to move this around, but it is very helpful to be able to get inside to lift the fabric up enough to get those pins going in. I think um, pinning is one of the secret hardest parts of sewing. Um, I make pinning look very easy and I've had lots of people be like, you make it look so easy. But that is just the sheer amount that I've pinned over the last, you know, 25 years of sewing. I have the muscle memory to do it. So it feels and looks relatively effortless. But if you're starting out sewing and you really don't, you know, you haven't given yourself a lot of time to practice, pinning is going to feel like one of those things that should be easier when it's not easy for anybody at the beginning. Pinning is like one of those, it's kind of like, what could I compare it to? It's like chopping vegetables when you're cooking. Chopping vegetables is like the secret hard thing where if you chop all your vegetables way too big, like cooking time is faster or slower or something. So getting your chopping game down is like half of the, the ease of cooking. So give yourself some grace space to be bad at hand stitching and be bad at pinning and just focus on mending some stuff and getting to like experience joy from the the intention of mending something and you know the more you're like wow I got to wear those jeans for like an extra five years after the crotch blew out um that will make like doing this whole process over and over again more fulfilling I aspire to be able to diagnose fabric by touch alone. That is a really good aspiration to have. Um, I have to say my thrifting game has um, exponentially elevated being able to identify the difference between real silk and imposter silk, which is just polyester, aka plastic. Um, but you know, Ever since the 80s, those polyester manufacturers, they've really been trying to imitate silk for a long time and they've gotten really good at it. But being able to identify real silk from polyester with just a touch, you know, that helps with, with thrifting. Okay, got it to a good point. But you know what I just noticed is that my patch moved while I was pinning and I'm like, I'm kind of like too lazy to resituate the whole thing. I'm like, we've been sewing for an hour, over two hours, so I'm getting tired. So I'm, I'm not going to repin the whole thing. I'm just going to cut another little patch and I'm sticking this on the side. Okay, so 
once I do that, blah, 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 let's say I did that, I am going to feel like pinning took like 15 minutes. <laughs> um, okay, so now I have my workspace here. I'm trying to get it to a place where, again, I'm going to roll up the pant leg so I have a little bit closer access to this area. <clears throat> and I have this needle threaded from earlier with some navy thread on it. So let me tie my knot. I'm going to show you again how I like to tie my knot. Lick the tip of my index finger. I'm going to pinch the thread and wrap it around my index finger once so I get this X across my index finger. And I'm going to pinch it with my thumb and roll the, the wrap off of my thumb. And I'm still holding it. And then I'm going to take my other finger and scrape that messy bundle to the end. And now I've got this I like, I, I really think it looks like a mosquito. It's got like little legs and a big messy body. And that is a nice thick knot that won't pull through the fabric as I'm sewing. Stick my arm into the leg here and I'm gonna start in between the two layers. And you can draw your grid on here if you'd like but that would cause me to stitch through this stretchy fabric a lot. And I really want that stretchy fabric to be as stretchy as possible. So I am actually just going to whip stitch. So whip stitch, I keep on picking thread that's like too matchy. <laughs> it's not ideal for this um, example, but if I hold it up like this, I think this thread contrasts enough. Okay. Um, this pin is already in my way. So let's get rid of that. And I'm holding, my thumb is right here on the other side. So I'm holding, kind of just pinching it in place. I've got my thread coming out right here and I'm gonna stitch into the patch and then back up through the leg. And I'm just gonna stitch around the edge of the opening here. Doing a, this is a whip stitch. So I'm doing it all from the front of the fabric. I'm not pushing my needle all the way to the back at all. I'm poking the tip of the needle in just about a quarter of an inch. I'm poking about a quarter of an inch in, and then I'm poking it back up. It's almost like a scooping motion with just the tip of my needle, where I poke in, scoop up. And using my thumb here is very helpful for creating enough leverage so that as I poke back up, I push down with my thumb right next to it. And if I get any loops, I want to just slow down enough to smooth out my stitches there. And this part of the jean, really no one sees it. This is all up in the crotch and your stitches do not need to be attractive in any way. You just need this patch to stay in place. I don't care what it looks like. And I am stitching faster rather than slower right now. <laughs> all right, but you get the idea. I'm gonna go all the way around. As I come to the really thick part of the seam, it's gonna be hard to poke through all the layers. So I might just, well, no, that was a little bit easier than I thought. But um, if you find that it's too thick to poke through, try to just catch each layer individually. Oh yeah, it's getting tougher now. That's like six or so layers of fabric right there. Ooh, but I got a tangle right at this part, of course, right at the end. I think that's a sign that I should just put these to the side. I don't see any um, questions, so I am going to come back to this later. But I'm going to show you my last little bit. My cat put a hole in this precious hoodie. And I'm going to use this little tiny bit of thread that I have left over from earlier. And I'm going to start with the knot on the back side. And I'm going to do like a shoelace motion. So the thread is coming out of the top here. So I'm going to put my needle up underneath the hole and catch it and then go back in the other direction. So my thread is coming up through the fabric. I'm going to poke it 
oops, I just pulled the knot full out. So let me go back and do that again. Also with a knit fabric, if you can see any of the loops coming out, go ahead and catch any of those loops. But I'm essentially going to move around in a circle to stitch like a asterisk in place so that I'm catching the hole from multiple directions and slowly but surely closing up the hole. And there might be a little bit of an opening left, but at least that will keep it from unraveling any further. I might need a little bit more thread here. You get the idea. <laughs> All right, we are coming up on our last minute of this mending live stream. And I'd just like to say thank you all so much for tuning in. And I believe that this will be recorded and saved eventually. So if you need someone to sit with you while you stitch, you can play this recording. Um, and it'll be like we're together stitching. <laughs> I am a big fan of watching um, like YouTube videos and stuff and like watching people make stuff while I make other different stuff. Um, I haven't quite explored Twitch as much. I think exploring Twitch more in the future will be fun. So I stitched right up to the edge of the needle and I didn't have space to tie my knot. So I'm doing a little surgical knot, which was cutting off the needle and then using the two ends of the thread to just tie it together a bunch of times. Thank you so much for sharing my website. Yes, go check out my website. It's a do for an upgrade or an update. But I've got um, information about other workshops that I've taught in the past. And I've got some products up there. I also have been making masks. So if you want a three layer mask, I make them to order. And I am very active on my social media stories. If you want to follow along on my like day to day behind the scenes. Okay, that's not a beautiful patch, but it will keep that hole. Ooh, I feel like there was a bug. Um, that will keep that hole from getting bigger. Hey. Thank you all for tuning in. Yes, we all love mask, mask wearing. We gotta wear our masks. Okay, I'm back to these jeans and I am going to get a new length of thread here before it gets any shorter. So I'm going to just tie this off as easily as I can by doing some stitching a loop and then just catching that thread back through it. I just poked myself with the needle. That is okay. Okay. Fresh thread. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. I'm going to keep working for a little bit until the next person comes on. So.